Now you've always been someone who goes against the system <laughs> to a point where your iconic film up until I had to be made under false pretenses. This idea of, uh, of a gangster who gets put right in the middle of this pressure cooker of defiance, uh, uh, somebody who has no political values actually is under pressure to make a stand. That was the core to create this, this story. So. You know, we started working on that, and the, the producer in London, he was he was very committed. I mean, he basically sold his apartment to finance. Oh. This is the beginning of, yeah, making this oh. film. You need somebody by your side when you start in this journey. You can't do it alone. Welcome to the Film This Show, where we talk about the business of film, both locally and internationally. My name is Marcus Mabusela. We're so excited for this guest because he's lived a life and a half. I kid you not. He ran a nightclub called Scratch that beat segregation laws during apartheid. He created an anti-apartheid film through pretending his script was about something else, when in reality, it was fighting against the dangerous system. He created five films, and four of them have been screened at the Cannes, and recently his iconic film Mapanzola has been re-released in HD for everyone to view. Everyone, please welcome the amazing, phenomenal, visionary film director Oliver Schmidt. Welcome, Oliver. Marcus, so good to thank see you very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> All the way from Berlin. How's the yes. weather that side? <laughs> I can't tell you how hot it is. I think uh, I think the, the the climate is swapping things around here. It's been like thirty degrees, and 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 this is September, and and we, the summer just keeps going on and on. That's a big surprise. Funny, you know, coming from this continent, we're always assuming that Europe is cold all year round. Well, I tell you, when I came here first, the winter was minus twenty degrees, and that is cold. And, yeah. And. Uh, I uh, thought, so what am I doing here? But uh, now <laughs> it might go down to minus five, six, seven, but they shorter, mm. milder. It's not what it used to be. Things definitely are changing. There's something in the air, isn't there? Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, no. A lot of people know some of the work you've done and you've done, I mean, some amazing projects. But as I mentioned earlier, you've had a very active life and you were born during a very harrowing time in South Africa. Can you just uh, maybe tell us more about your upbringing um, in SA? Sure. I, I, I was born in, at the height of apartheid. I was born, I think, in the year which where South Africa left the Commonwealth. And uh, and it was the time of Africana uh, nationalism and Africana affirmative action, basically, where they took all the main jobs in governments and and, uh, and set the whole tone, you know, growing up as a kid in education, you know, it was full of uh, nas Africana nationalist propaganda as well, you know. And it was very strange growing up in suburbs <clears throat> of Cape Town where, you know, you kind of figure, okay, something seems wrong here, but you don't know yet quite 100% what it is, you know. and. Your parents, immigrants themselves, are uncomfortable about the situation, and you see, okay, so there's black people, but how come the only black people I see are the ones who come and work here, and then they go away? Where do they go to? You know, so it's just like, it, as a child, you try to understand these things, and they don't quite make sense to you, and um, and then you start seeing the bad side and the horrible side and the side that compromises you as a human being because you think, okay, so I'm white. Does this mean I stand for these things? And, you're, and then you start making your own decisions in life. And you say, no, I don't want to stand for this. This is terrible. So it was a time of them, uh, you know, trying to convince us black people were inferior. It was a time of, um, in the northern suburbs of Cape Town anyway, of no cultural debate or no, not the kind of thing that might have happened in Johannesburg, for instance, uh, sort of a political uh, debate and, 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 and something you could access in terms of people who knew everything, you know, it was zero. It was uh, a suburban wasteland. 
<clears throat> and and uh, censorship was there as well, of course. You know, what you heard on the radio, what you read in the papers, and what you saw in the cinemas. And everything was cut out of movies that had to do with race issues, with sex, with religion, politics, and the movies would just jump. You'd see a scene and then suddenly it jumps and you don't know, it doesn't feel right, something's happening. <laughs> where's, this, where's this story going? Something's missing. And then you're just getting into it and watching it again. And then again, there's another jump. You think, okay, something else has gone. Or what's going on here? You know, so you, you try to piece these films together that you're seeing. And you know there's something missing and you're trying to make do with what's there. I mean, I can give you a basic example. There was a James Bond film and he falls in love with, uh, with a black CIA agent. And of course, that whole thread was gone from the film, you know. So it's absurd. It had an absurd side to it, you know. Um, and growing up in the 60s and early 70s, you know, after the Rivonia trial and that whole generation of uh, struggle leaders going to jail, there was first, they kind of squashed every uh, resistance in that sense. And, you know, from the early 70s, it started building up again. And when I was just finishing school, it was 1976. And it was painfully clear, you know, even to somebody growing up in a very naive environment that this was, it wasn't even just segregation, it was war, you know, so it, um, it uh, was shameful. And I'm glad that society has moved on. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, that's a really a, a horrific time to, to, you know, be brought up in I can only imagine as someone who's um, you know who's come up in this generation um, you know we can only imagine just the difficulty of it all you know uh, but I want to ask you as an individual now as you grew up and you know as a youth you kind of came together with a group of your friends and you guys came up with an anti-segregation nightclub you know, um, how did that how did that happen? Um, you guys founding this nightclub. What's the story behind that? Um, well, I think the nightclub was one of the pivotal experiences in my life, and it changed my life a lot. You know, it's the first time uh, us as a generation of young white kids and black kids actually came together, and. Uh, we it started very innocently with parties you know we were studying art and we we went to parties we didn't like the music so we took our own records and then started playing them and this became popular and there were a few people who were a bit older in the group you know 10 15 years older so that experience how to set up structures and do stuff and uh they started actively looking for a venue and we found our old sailors club, which used to be a famous sailors club in Cape Town in the 60s, I think, um, and rented this venue. And apparently in the law, if you didn't sell liquor, um, it, they couldn't enforce race segregation laws. Don't ask me why, but it just one of those things. It was probably because no club would think of not selling liquor because that's how they <laughs> made their money. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we weren't interested in making money. We wanted to have a party. So suddenly we had kids from Langa and Gogoletu and, and Mittels Plain coming to the club. And, I mean, we already played a mixture of punk and African music and we played South African music and we played West African mu music. And um, as more and more black kids came, the, the, the focus shifted also more and more to reggae and... Uh, so not so much necessarily the African music, but the but the reggae side. So it became a huge uh, reggae following in the club, and and, and so lots of too. stoners, lots of stoners in the club. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, okay. who, you know, the thing is, who needs alcohol when you know? Yeah, so got it's <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. It's safer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's less mm. aggressive. You know, True. alcohol. The whole alcohol thing in clubs always makes people aggressive and fighting and we had a very so strict true. law policy to make it a safe space for everybody mm. anyway so there we were suddenly you know in one place all together doing one thing 
after having grown up completely separately. And it, it just, out of something very small and naive, something important happened. And then the police realized that something was going on here and saying, why are all these black kids coming into town at night and then realizing what was happening? So they got they got very nasty. They used to go to the railway stations and try and chase people away and make them go back to townships. And then they came to the club and and started harassing. And they tried to arrest one of our patrons outside the club once, and they got a handcuff on his one hand, and he hit the policeman in the face wow. and ran inside. And we hit him in the safe next to the DJ stand. We had these big safes where the records were kept in. Uh, and then the police came in and they were absolutely furious. And they made everybody go out one person at a time. And this crowd on the street was getting bigger and bigger and more restless and restless. And they were furious that they couldn't find him. Um, so it was war from then on, you know, and they used to make pretenses to break into the club saying, oh, there's been a robbery and they'd break in or they beat up one of one of our group very badly once. And, uh, you know, this carried on for another year probably and then we closed. But, but it changed everybody's lives who went there. A lot of the white kids, including myself, uh, said, well, I'm not going to the South African apartheid army. I'm not going to do that. And they left the country. I did too. And... Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there were any of the white kids there joined MK. I don't think they were ready consciously that far to do stuff like that. But but some of the black kids did. I know afterwards they did. Uh, they went and joined MK. You know. So, but everybody who was there was there together, and it changed all our lives. Interesting. That's that's uh, very fascinating. How how did you manage to to escape? Um, what do they call this infantry? Um, you know, the call up to 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 the army because I, apparently it was very difficult to do at that time as a young white male. Yeah, well, you could study and as long as you studied, you didn't have to go. And then I finished my studies and then I registered in Joburg to study, but it was just buying myself time. And then they realized, no, I don't want to come. So they then tried to send me to one of the worst infantry battalions uh, that they had, which was going to Angola at that time. And I'd made up my mind, I'd just stay as long as I can and then I'll leave. So <clears throat> I booked a flight while I was in Zimbabwe and from Zimbabwe, I then flew to Germany. I have two passports because of my German background and heritage. And so I ended up in Germany. Uh, in winter and uh, uh, with a lot of people who looked kind of very serious and hmm. not very happy in winter. Hmm. Not quite sure what I was doing there, but I, I didn't regret leaving. I did the right thing. It just was a weird time for me, but there was no question. You know, my father also fought in the Second World War. Sure. And he was a German soldier in Russia and it, it, it lived through the most terrible things. So they could understand my decision, but there was no ways I was going to enforce apartheid either as a soldier in the townships or go and fight a colonial war in Angola. So, hmm. Interesting. I would assume that uh, because your father had gone through the hardship of war, I mean, we've seen so many of these films, um, you find that, uh, you know, parents are usually proud to have generations in the army. So it was, uh, it was quite interesting that your father, you know, supported you in, in your resistance. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the, the German history in the Second World War is not an honorable one. And yeah. uh, and he um, he saw the most terrible things. And he was in, a bes in Russia in a besieged town where out of 20,000 German soldiers, 175 escaped, you know. So... Um, he he was in hell. He saw the hell, and he was saw he, the. Ad was he one of the ones that escaped? Yeah, yeah. The others, the others died, or. Well, the hundred and seventy-five left managed to creep out through Russian lines at night, and of the, 
of the other 20,000, the most most of them died, and I think 3,000 ended up in uh, Soviet uh, prison and prisoner of war camps. So you know, it's uh, it's he saw the the hell, he saw the ideological fanaticism yeah. of of the Nazis, and uh, he was not a political person, but he saw the destruction and the wastefulness and the tragedy of it. So, you know, pride was not the, 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 the main emotion that he had about all that. Very interesting. It's amazing yeah. how, how propaganda and storytelling can lead human beings to do atrocious things and Absolutely. vice versa. Yeah. And I'm assuming yeah. that's, that's possibly what inspired you to become a filmmaker. What was that inspiration for you to start telling stories? How did it start? Well, I did, I didn't know initially, I wasn't sure did I want to become a fine artist or a filmmaker. Um, but I saw some radical movies when I was about 17. Cape Town had its first international film festival and it showed films which were not censored. They got special permission and suddenly all these 70s filmmakers like Herzog and Fassbender and Nicholas Rogue and Linda Anderson and, and, and more and more and more, they all had films which were incredibly daring and political and, and to some degree radical. Uh, in the sense of what they were saying. Uh, nothing like what we'd been taught or brought up on. And um, <clears throat> I was so impressed by the, by the strength of the, the courage of this vision that I thought this, this gives me hope um, that there's a bigger world out there and that it was, it was incredibly inspiring for me. So, you know, there was no film school in South Africa at that time. There was one in Pretoria, which I think was quite conservative. I didn't want to go to that. So I, I, I ended up going to find art school in Cape Town, and they said they had a film course. They didn't really. So I had a great time, and the club was great, but it was a kind of slightly roundabout route to try and find this journey to filmmaking. Yeah. Um, it only really started seriously in my last year. I started making my own experimental films. And then I was in Joburg for one year. I started working as an assistant editor and editor. So I got to know the workings of film a little bit better. And that's how I got in to filmmaking via editing. And that, that must have been a, a great learning experience to uh, be able to learn hands on. Uh, what what were some of the films you made? I mean, you said you, you did an experimental films. In the genesis of your your filmmaking um, career, I would say, uh, what were some of the, the, the more uh, interesting subjects, matters that you were actually drawn towards? Well, the experimental was very experimental. You know, it, it, was, it was very abstract in the first year of working there. And then, then after that, I was, I was, you know, I worked as an assistant editor. Uh, but I then cut my first documentary. Um, it, I was one of three editors, but I did the main bulk of the work, which I did until I had to leave, and then somebody else finished it. It was a documentary film called "The The Two Rivers," and it was, it was, a film narrated by. Um, a man, a philosopher, think of you like from from Venda, mm. and it was partly about Venda culture, but in a larger sense, it was about South Africa and uh, the destruction of traditional values and culture, and 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 the consequences of apartheid on identity of, of whole peoples. You yes. know, so it was a very intense project to work on. Um, um, and, and Which year I, was I start, this? That was in 1983. I was very brave of you in that time to create such a story. Well, I was the editor on that. I was. Okay. I didn't create it. You know, the filmmaker mm. was called Mark Newman. But, but, but I worked on it, and that, and that was great. You know, and uh, and you know, then I went to Germany and. Uh, Worked for television there, but 
but before when I was, uh, I cut that film, but I was also working with a group of people where I met Thomas Mokotlani working on a low budget film. And, and that, that kind of inspired me to keep contact with Thomas Mokotlani and to talk to him about doing a project which ended up in the project Mapansulo. Now, you've always been someone who goes against the system, goes against the norms, the grain, you would say, <laughs> to a point where your iconic film, Mapanzula, had to be made under false pretenses. I mean, what, what, what inspired the creation of this film in particular? At exactly that time when I left South Africa, the defiance in South Africa was growing, but also the police brutality was growing. So I was sitting there very far away, just seeing the news images on, on television. And the the idea of making a film didn't leave me. And, uh, and I met a young producer in London. He wasn't a producer yet. He was a locations manager, but he was inspired to make a film with me. And... He pushed me and 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 kind of uh, said we can do this. And uh, I kept in touch with uh, Thomas. And we there was no email back then, so we wrote letters to each other. And uh, this idea of of a gangster who get uh, sort of gets put right in the middle of this pressure cooker of defiance, uh, uh, somebody who has no political values actually is under pressure to make a stand, that was the core to create this this story. So, you know, we started working on that and the, the producer in London, he was he was very committed. I mean, he basically sold his apartment to finance sure. since the beginning of, yeah, making mm. this film, you know. So, you know, you, ne you need, this is what I told film students recently as well, you need somebody by your side when you start in this journey. You can't do it alone. It's important to have... Um, not just people you work with, but people who support you um, on a very deep level. You know, it can be a director-actor relationship or director-producer, writer. In this in this sort of space, there has to be a safe space where you people keep telling you it'll work, it'll happen. Mm. You know. Mm. So because I spent many nights or many weekends working flat out to write draft of the script based on my discussions with Thomas. And um, <clears throat> and and then we got closer and closer to seeing. Okay, well, maybe there is a way to do this. Mm. No, I you mean, know, this... and mm. and and sorry, and 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 you you ask about the, the the whole cover story of the thing. Well, it was clear to make this kind of film about struggle and uprising. You know, on on the on the simplistic level it's a gangster story, but obviously it's not a gangster story. It's a, it's a story of oppression in a whole society and 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 the and, a, and the attempt to dehumanize a whole nation. You know, so it's it's about resistance. And uh but you can't come to South Africa at that time and say, okay, I'm gonna make a film. It's about resistance and it's uh, it's um Mzabalazo and its struggle and its. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you work that out? <laughs> <laughs> so, I um, so there's no ways we're going to get permission to do this, and and I was AWOL from the army, so I'm coming back on my German passport, oh. pretending I'm not South African, and then pretending I'm not making a a, a struggle movie, as oh. you, if you will. So I thought you've got to be super careful with this. And I decided we need to write a fake script and have a fake story. And there's nothing political about this. And it's a story about um, uh, maybe a good policeman and a gangster and uh, maybe another criminal. And uh, politics is, plays no role in the story except maybe to make the police look good. You know, so it's mm. this is a whole, a whole, <laughs> a whole BS story to, mm. <laughs> to, because we had to get permission not only to shoot in Soweto, we needed a cover story for the film, and uh, we had to run the gauntlet of a whole industry which was not reformed. You know, I mean, the the the, the laboratory towards the end figured out that what was happening wasn't cool, and I think they called the security police who came looking, and they tried to sabotage some of the footage. So we were lucky, but 
to be lucky and to get on that journey of making it and not having the film confiscated, we had to be very careful. That's um, extremely uh, brave of, of you guys at that age to, to have done what you've done. But now Mabantula is so important that it's taught in schools, literally. I mean, what about the story uh, resonates most with you and what do you think makes it uh, have more resonance with uh, the audiences? Um, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, not, it's not a film told for the privileged, whoever the privileged are. It's a, it's a film told for people who get shat on from above. Yeah, well, In this case, it's black people in South Africa at the time. But it's a film from the perspective of black South Africans. It's not a film made for Hollywood. It's not a film made for your middle class audience. It's a film made for South Africans, primarily, first and foremost, for black yeah. South Africans who felt it and went through it and could say, yeah, at last, this is it. This is what we do. Yeah. I yeah. mean, this is what we live through, you know, mm, and uh, mm. it, it, it attempted to say, okay, that's the audience and not okay, we're trying to impress a festival or we're trying to impress LA, or we're trying to impress some Hollywood people. Not at all. Mm. By the time when you were creating this, were you even aware of, um, you know, uh, what these other international festivals are looking for? You know, did you go and shop it around? What was the response in that time? It must have been insane. Well, I mean, the, 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 the thing was to make this film. That was the overriding thing. And the thing was, for me, the most subversive thing is to make a film to give a voice to all of this in South Africa, for South Africans. Anything that was censored that you couldn't see in cinemas, on, t on TV, on radio, to bypass all of that, you know. And, and sure. then... What happened, of course, is that uh, people took note outside of the country and it, it, it premiered in uh, Cannes in the film festival and uh, and then um, it had a big release in London and it showed in 52 countries. So there was a resonance to it at that time, you know, and that's the one side. And the other side is in South Africa, we thought, okay, how are we going to get this film out there now? So the censor board saw the film, they freaked. They but used to have police. I'm, sh I'm sure it's it's was this uh, after post production was done or the, the yeah yeah yeah. I mean okay. I mean we we edited the film and then because the police started asking nasty questions or, or uncomfortable ones, I took the the film cans to London to make sure that the film is safe. Hmm. So um, post post was done in the, within the country. Uh, the the film had just been edited, finished, and before it hmm. had been screened. And we started getting uh, weird guys who came to the edit room saying they're journalists. But, you know, security police dressed in a very specific way back then. And it was not fashionable. And you could spot them a mile off how they dressed. It was like gray shoes and funny pants and this and that. And, you know, <laughs> nobody else looked like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't uniform. It was just their own dress It was style. just a look, but it was okay. a look. Okay. Oh. And uh, and then they they demanded a copy of the film, and our lawyer said, "Well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to give them a copy." So we gave them a videotape, and then we heard nothing for months. Was it was it, was the videotape the actual footage or no? It bit... was the actual film. Yeah, the film, yeah. the completed film. Yeah. Uh, the film is now out of the country. Fine. Mm. So we gave them mm. a copy. We couldn't get around that mm. because even if the film was going to come out, it's going to happen anyway. So. And then we didn't hear from them. And then apparently what happened is they they lost the copy and they were too embarrassed to admit that they could do something <laughs> like that. You're lucky stars, eh? You have to count <laughs> them. All. They lost the copy. They lost sure. the copy. How they lucky were you guys, eh? You dodged yeah, the we bullet were lucky. there. <laughs> you dodged the bullet. But I always believe whatever's meant to happen will eventually happen. And very clearly this story was supposed to be told and nothing... Yeah or anyone could hold it back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how we felt. And, you know, we didn't think of ourselves as being brave. We just thought of uh, this, we have to do this. We have to do this. This is yeah. happening. It's got to happen now. Yeah. And 
And it was weird because the censor board saw it and they were they had police and military on the censor board back then. And they, they almost had a heart attack. And then on the other hand, you had the head of the censor board was supposedly liberal. And then there was this Mnet Awards where the film was. And he, the head of the censor board, there and he comes and congratulates me. And I think, okay, what's going on? <laughs> You, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but no, but they wanted the film to be cut and they wanted uh. 13, 13 cuts to be made in the film, you know. So, anything to do with toy toying or attacks on police or brutality or anything they wanted out. So, we said, no, we're not doing that. Uh, yeah. And th at that stage, there was a bit of a fight because the producer wanted to make his money and the creative said, no ways. So, we, we, we kind of had a bit of a fallout at that stage, but we decided to let the film be pirated and go out in VHS. So that's why South Africans saw that film. I mean, later on uh, SABC and so on, but that's how, why most South Africans saw that film on on, on VHS tapes. And, and it's a bad copy that's been around for many years, and that's why I've restored the film and so it can be seen properly now. But um, that, that was the decision, you know, so that the film is available. I mean, Oliver, you've had a very active film and television career since then. You know, you've worked in, uh, you know, award shows and, and festivals. You've, you've practically created a very huge name for yourself. And I wonder, <laughs> does your German background have a big influence on how you approach your projects, knowing how the, the German psyche works? <laughs> I don't know, but yes, somehow, absolutely. You know, as much as I'm South African, I'm German. It's like, uh, it's uh, there's a certain. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if the workaholic side of me is German or South African. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, South Africans go out into the world and they think they're not good enough. You know, compared to other people, so they work so harder. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's a very different kind of mentality, hey. Um, I wonder, uh, but I guess that is the legacy of apartheid. Um, I, I do find myself, espe especially when I'm around Americans, that sure, it, it seems like my, my self-image, they've got a, a far bigger self-image than, than we do as South Africans. Uh, you know, you, you would even say they're more confident. They're a bit more mm -hmm. louder. Their, their chest is popped out slightly yeah. more than ours. And, and we are great people. We're great people. Um, yeah, I guess the legacy of apartheid, is, you know, still stands in that way where people have not been able to to celebrate their, their, their uniqueness sure. and greatness over the years. Yeah, it's uh, pride is a complicated thing, you know, and I think Americans are, are, are happy with who they are. Um, mm. and, and, and South Africans are still trying to find the balance of, of, of that. You know, it's like... Uh, Pride to fight against apartheid, yeah, pride to be a South African. Well, at that time, it was really hard, you know, and proud mm. to be a white person, no. <laughs> so it was very complicated stuff you have to deal with. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's crazy. I mean, after 94, we had a whole campaign to kind of, you know, work on, on the sense, on our mentality, um, being optimistic about the Rainbow Nation. I'm sure you were part of that explosion of celebration in that time. What, um, as we just kind of geared into democracy, did you see that your, your, your style of, of storytelling or your subject matters, did it kind of change or, or, or what gear did you go into as soon as we, we went into 94? Well, you know, I think a lot of artists were left at a position where they finally finding them a voice, a kind of voice of opposition, but, but then you're not in opposition anymore. And yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing because, mm. you know, you, you to trying to, if you like, get up the carriage or find the language or find the way of talking about stuff. And suddenly you want to make all these films and people say, oh, but that's done. It's past. It's finished. Yeah. You know, and I spent a long time working on a project <clears throat> at the end, before the end of apartheid, but moving into that new age about, about Robert McBride, who was a, um, uh, Mkonto Wessis were operative and mm. he was very well known at that time. Um, he was very successful at smuggling arms into the country. A lot of people hated him because he put a bomb in a bar in Durban. 
Um, but he was, you know, he was a fighter and he, they arrested him and he escaped. And so this is, it was an incredible story. And I went to see him when he was on death row and I pretended to be a friend of the family. And I, I spent like 30 visits with him. Couldn't write anything down, but I, 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 I memorized everything he told me. And then I would sit, go and sit down in some Pretoria takeaway place and, and, and write it down. Or, or when I had some time, I would go to Mabupane and go and visit Dolly Ratebe, who insisted on making a meal for me. And, you know, it was, <laughs> so this is all merged into one at that time. And it, and I, I, I didn't have much money, but I, I tried to use the means I had to develop this story. And, um, and this was 89. And I even went to Lusaka and I went to speak to Chris Hani and I gave him the short version of the script to read. And I was amazed that he would meet me, but I think it's also on the basis of having made Mapansula and it was a film that was seen in Lusaka as well. Um, and he came, he came with his wife and his two kids. And I'm amazed, you know, just somebody who were living in such a dangerous condition with a, with a price on his head would, would do that. And he sent me a note the next day. He, th he said he thought it was well researched and wished me well with the project. And I've almost found money for it twice, but to make a film with the politics, you know, which is kind of, a more radical film than Mapatsula because it's kind of by any means necessary and difficult moral things like civilians dying in a bar from a bomb. People were very scared to put money into that. So it almost happened once uh, with a company, big French company who did Bertolucci films. They went bust with a Bertolucci film. So that didn't happen. And then it almost happened again with a Spanish producer who'd made some very good films. But by that stage, Robert McBride was out of jail and then suddenly he didn't want the film to be told like this anymore. I think it was a very balanced story, but it wasn't heroic enough for him. And well, her real life is never completely heroic. So, we, you know, I spent five years of my life working on that and it didn't happen. But but this is the journey of filmmaking. Some of some of these things work and some, some don't work out. And years later I made Shepherds and Butchers, which is about death row. And that whole experience with Robert McBride in death row and walking through those buildings and 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 being creeped out by it and having nightmares from being in there, you know, all of that helped me at the end of the day make the other film. Very interesting. Yeah. But, but mm. <laughs> it was hard to let go of, but the struggle is not over. And it actually, it, it wasn't over. But the feeling of positiveness, euphor euphoria and good feeling was contrary to this kind of subject matter. And it yeah. was con probably contrary to the frequency in which you were at, because you were probably still in 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 Mzabalazo mode. I I yes. experienced that. I experienced that once uh, a few years back during the Fees Must Fall, um, you know, uh, what should I call it? Fees Must Fall strikes, and yes. um, <clears throat> I was producing a play, which we took to the National Arts Council, and I got phenomenal, phenomenal alumni from uh, UCT, hmm. and um, the story wasn't so much related to the Fees Must Fall subject matter. But because they'd, they'd been in this, and they were very in, in, integral in, in, in what was happening in Cape Town, when we got to, to uh, Grahamstown, and because I was an inexperienced producer, director, you know, my administration was not so great. And I thought I'd formed a sense of camaraderie with these guys. And shoo, what I loved about them turned on me. Now I yes. was the I was the oppressor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really? couldn't I couldn't pay the week's wages, and they down tools. And now wow. that we, I mean, they're older now, and we're friends. And they, you know, one of them, my buddy, you know, he was like, you know what, Marcus, sorry about that, because we were we were conscient, we were so much into that frequency. Everything yes. was about rebellion, and we didn't yes. see the bigger picture that you were trying to build. Yes. And the fact that you were inexperienced at that time and you'd made some mistakes. So um, 
I guess I guess it's it's almost like the same in your situation where now it's you know it's the the story the Robert McBride story could not be made because that time had almost been been gone. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What's your take on, 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 I mean, you've, you've, you've seen a few seasons in this business. You've seen, you know, things come and things go, but what's your take on, on the element of timing, timing? Timing in, in what sense? In film? In, in yeah, film? Is the, it the, yeah, the time in which a story is, is, is acceptable. Um, ah, you know, wh what do well. you want to tell, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this is the most important thing, you know. It's it's um, it's you're lucky if that timing is is spot on, you know. Mm. I think I think there are fashions, and you you can fit in with those fashions, you know. Yeah. Some you know whether it's dramas or horror films or, or comedies or uh, films about. Uh, rich versus poor you know they yeah. definitely are, are these sometimes it's one cult film and then there's a whole spin-off about 20 films people either copying or being inspired and then there's a whole thing that develops out of that that's fine but this is once off at the right place in the right moment i don't i don't think that happens that that often you're lucky if it happens <laughs> once in a lifetime yeah. mapansula was that kind of a thing um you know, uh, life above all is, is is about a small town in South Africa, and it's um, it's about a family struggling with AIDS and and being uh, ostracized, <laughs> uh, and about fear around illness and death. You know, so so was it the right time? Yeah, it was the right time, but was it the right time for the audience? I don't know. You know, this is this is this is the thing. You know, it it was a, a highly regarded film. It was on the Oscar shortlist. Well, Very proud know. of the film. Phenomenal. But it, it, it did a lot of people go to see it? Not that many, but that doesn't necessarily matter. I think it it it, it it's a statement within a time and it's not it's not intended as a negative statement. You know, we had our screening at Cannes. And the then um, South African Minister of Culture came with uh, with the art structures and she said to them, why do these people always make films like this? And it kind of shocked me because that's not the intention of making this film. It's, it wasn't intended to be a pess pessimistic negative film or a com it not It wasn't Afro-pessimism in, in any kind of way, you know. Um, but then I realized there's an incredible sensitivity from the higher echelons of nation building uh, about <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, there is. I mean, um, it goes to show with, uh, with uh, you know, that department who were there and scrutinizing the film and people who were chopping the film, you know, films back in the day to try and censor it so people could not receive the information. But it goes to show that, you know, the people in the higher echelons um, of, of society are very much aware of the power of film. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I was having a conversation with a friend um, who's also a parent, just like myself, to say, you know, I'm, in this day and time, it's so crazy how, you know, these, these kids regurgitate what they see on television. And some of these cartoons are extremely toxic. Um, and as parents, you have to monitor the content in which they consume. So now the responsibility has now come within the household to say, no longer is it controlled just by government because it seems like now money rules the world. Uh, people just, you know, they consume whatever pays the bill, I guess, uh, you know, yeah. whatever is put out there. Um, but it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the individuals within the home, what gets consumed and what's not, you know. But I mean, mm -hmm. now with the, with the critical, you know, success of Mampantola and now with, with its, uh, you know, acclaim, it brings a sense of nostalgia within the industry. Is this something within uh, the TV, film and, 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 and television space um, that kind of excites you, resonates with you right now because you, you've gone through all these periods and these seasons, what is it that keeps you going? What is it that keeps you inspired? 
what keeps me inspired is looking for a different perspective or turning things on their head or or uh, or poking at these issues, which which are moral, political issues, not not to wag a, fill, a finger, but because I just feel what you're talking about content. There's content which leaves us, you know, better, and there's content which leaves us worse, and there's content which does nothing. So if if content is like food, there's a lot of junk food out there, sure. Um, and it's great while you're eating it, but you got a, a stomach ache afterwards. But mm -hmm. my 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 aim and my 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 goal is to to search for something which will shift shift something in some small way. You know, I'm not pompous and don't think filmmakers are are God or anything like that at all. It's just to try and tell a story in a in an emotional, personal way, which has something else to say as well. And uh, it's not always easy, you know, you, you, some projects you sit on them and they don't happen, they don't move forward, but when they do, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding experience. Yeah. And, um, doing the whole restoration of Mapansula made me realize how I miss this, uh, this core impulse that led to that film. And it, it, it's a, it's a core impulse, which carried on to some degree in hijack stories as well. And I thought I would really like to make another film in Orlando East Soweto. I would like to make it a trilogy because yeah, both of the other films are shot in Orlando East. And um, that's what I discussed with the South African production company when I, when I was in Joburg recently, because I thought, I have an idea. I, there's a way to tell this as a generational thing. So you t you're making a story about a family essentially, but also making a film about other stuff, you know? The older generation is from the Mapansula time, the middle generation is from the high tech stories time, and the younger generation is the younger generation. And I keep coming back. You know, if I if I'd been an opportunist, I would have made one film and and taken it to Hollywood and said, Yeah, look, look, aren't I great? And I'm coming to be one of you guys now. I never did that. I didn't want to do that. Um so obviously for me it means something different. It's more personal and it's something that I want to give, I want to create and give back to South African society. I, th I, I feel indebted and I feel I belong. And even though I'm here, it's important to me. Otherwise I wouldn't keep doing this. Is there something about the the, the, the glitz and the lights of of Hollywood that kind of turns you off? What is it about the allure of Hollywood that, I, that it I, kind of I don't have a moral. I don't have a moral <clears throat> judgment on it. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's a huge playground and I think it's it's an incredible opportunity, but <coughs> it's not why I made Mapansula and it's not why I made any of the South African films I made. I mean, the one, I'd, Shepherds and Butchers, I used uh, uh, international stars and that was kind of a pre prerequisite on the film and it's, it's, a, it's a sort of... A, it's sort of outside of the, the box of what, I, what I've been doing. And if I made a third part in Soweto, it would that wouldn't play a role again. You know, I mean, I made life above all in Superi. I don't speak Superi, but I I set this to myself as a challenge to make that film completely in tune with one place in a, in time. And that had nothing to do with expectations for a white actor or for translating the language into another language so more people would understand or any of that, you know, so the specifics of being in one place in one time is what's important to me. And that's what happened with Paris Jatem, which was not South African, but part of the love stories set in Paris, uh, where each story is in a different part of Paris. So I, I spent a lot of time walking three, four days, just walking around that area, trying to figure out what would make a love story so different just here on the streets in this area that if you cross the road to that area, it'll be something completely different. It's kind of weird on one level, but I believe things are specific to place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, it's possibly, and I think it's important. Mm. So I just want to say this possibly why you'd find um, <clears throat> traditionally when people meet and they're from the same kind of area or background, um, you know, it uh, maybe there's more chances of, 
of that union kind of having, uh, you know, of lasting, I, I suppose, <laughs> because they share similar. <laughs> but we've seen through history, sometimes it does not always work out that way. But it's very interesting, the observation. Um, yeah, very, very so, interesting. So, so my, my journey is a bit, is a bit uh, different to some people's because a lot of people look for the universals and what mm. is the universal in the story and so on and so on. And yes, there are even de in specifics are universals, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite obsessed by that, that specific context of a specific story in a, in a specific place and space. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Life Above All was shot, uh, shot on the border of Limpopo and, uh, uh, it was shot near Moitse, which is on the border of Limpopo, and uh, I've, I'm having a brain fog here. Mm -hmm. it's but Zimbabwe. it's no, 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 no. It's uh, um, South African province up there, just before Limpopo. Uh, What's the South African province next to Limpopo? Isn't it the north? Where now you're exposing my ignorance when it comes to geography. Uh, I'm assuming it could it, be. It could is it in be. Pumalanga? No. It could be uh, in the northwest province. I'm assuming. I hope. Anyway, so it's it's on the it's on this weird border of culture. So mm. uh, most people speak Saperi, but some people speak Indebele, mm. and, uh, in and and this is reflected mm. in the film as well. Mm. You know, so. Mm. But as a director, that's what I mean. As a director, how is it to direct a language? which you can't speak how do you because i've <laughs> you know as an actor i've become I, I would say the kind of actor i am i am i'm very very if if actors were children i'd be that uh that child who needs nurturing from their director from the you know as soon as i i get the sense that oh this, this is the kind of director who just lets you do what you want i i get a bit disheartened i'm i love watching my director and understanding what they want to say, looking at their facial expression, getting a sense of where they want to go. So now if it's a, if it's a, in a language in which you don't understand, how do you kind of do that process of, of, you know, kind of translate, articulating your vision into my vessel as, as your tool? Well, I mean, every scene has an intention and every character in that scene has an intention and, and, uh, and and uh, even a script like this has got the English translation on the one side and the superior on the other side, and then you have to trust the process. And and and, and if you, uh, I think if you if you you have empathy and you and you listen to ton tonality and you and you okay, you don't understand the words individually, but you understand the the expression of the words. Um, it's it's weird maybe, but. It kind of works for me. I mean, I did it with Paris Jatem as well. I mean, mm. I don't speak French, you know. Mm. So, and maybe because I've had hearing problems all these years, maybe I focus less on the on the Wonderful. spoken word mm. and more on on the face mm. and what is happening there, mm. you know. Mm. It's, it's 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 just amazing how the f the human faculties get to be amp amplified when the others aren't so strong. I was at Beethoven. Who also had a hearing impediment and became just a phenomenal, you know, composer. Um, mm. So I find that fascinating. Um, yeah, but um, now, <clears throat> Oliver, we're going to move to another segment of our show. Um, that's yes. the game segment. Now we've got a, a, a quite a cool game to play with you. It's called Fill in the Blank. Okay, so we're going to say. Okay a part of a sentence and you will fill in the missing part according to whatever you feel you want to say. <laughs> cool. Now, um, number one, I make films because... Because I want to communicate. I make films to surprise. Hmm. To surprise. It's beautiful. The best film location in the world is... Orlando East. Orlando East! Ay, 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 ay. Parani! Ah, you're my guy, man. You're my guy. <laughs> I had a wonderful guest on the show, and she said Cape Town. I'm like, what? Can we be creative? 
I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My dream movie lead is. Is the one that I'm hopefully going to be working with, Tim Roth. Hey, all the best. All the best. Is there a movie that you guys are working on at the moment? Okay. Yeah. Hopefully that goes well. <laughs> awesome. You cannot make a movie without. Humility. Oh, wow. Cheers to you, Oliver. A few filmmakers need to learn that. You cannot make a movie without humility. This thing is not a one man show and it's not an ego trip. It's not. It's, it's not. We are going into war and everyone must serve their fellow comrades, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, never bring mmm to my set. Arrogance. Never bring arrogance to my set. Ah, wonderful. Love that. Uh, the next one. Besides money, I'd sell my films for... Smiles. Smiles. Lovely. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> that is the real currency here of the earth, actually. Emotions. That's emotions. That's the true currency. I feel like all this other stuff is just, uh, you know, one big illusion. But that's a topic for another day. I think people who put pineapple, pineapple on pizza are... Hawaiian. Hawaiian. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I do have a bit of a island uh, jeans sorry, in me. I'm sorry to Hawaiians. <laughs> if you could collaborate with anyone else in South Africa on a film, who would it be? Jamil Kubeka. Jamil Kubeka. Shout out to Jamil, man. We still have to get him on the show. I, I, I think Do that it. man, he's, uh, he really is, uh, you know, the kind of guy you meet once in a generation. Um, definitely. Yeah. Guys, we're going to have Jamil soon. Watch this. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, next question. Which director from anywhere in the world do you admire and why? I'm going to start with the first one that I really admired, and that was Stan Stanley Kubrick. Oh, yeah, definitely. I saw 2001 Space Odyssey, mm. and I think it was the first film I saw which had a, a vision about <clears throat> mankind, mm. uh, space, AI. Mm. I mean, really, it's about AI as well, which mm. is happening now. And, and mm. I thought he was such a visionary. I saw that film 10 times. Mm. 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 It really is quite a, a responsibility as a storyteller to, you know, to carry the eyes, the thoughts of, of, of your audience into the future or into the past with mm -hmm. care. Yeah, it's, it's a huge responsibility and he's done that very well. Here we are about 20 years later, right in the thick of the subject matter, AI yeah, ab and absolutely. space. And yeah, it's a yeah. phenomenal. Well, Oliver, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We've had an amazing time together, you know, learning Marcus, from you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been great. It's been great. And, and we've discussed things in a way that I, some of these discussions we've had in a way I've never spoken to anybody about in this yeah. way. So it's it's yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that, you know, South Africa is going to learn so much from you, especially these young creatives, um, because you are, the custodians of our heritage you are one of the ones who've who've, who've kind of you know paved and and shaped um how uh, you know the look and feel of our narrative today so we want to thank you you know learning from you through the, all these amazing films you've created and the influence you continue to have on the industry is phenomenal and we truly truly as a film biz show cannot wait to see your latest works your drive and your passion, your love for the craft are well noticed. So we thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored and humbled. Thank you very much. Take care. We would like to say thank you to Fortune World, the Dynamic Workspaces, as well as the Magic Lightbox Company for supporting and sponsoring this episode. Please make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this channel.